We're going to take you on a really great tour, starting in Siam with the king of the day, Rama V, um, and his admiral of the navy. And then we go to England in the early 1800s, then back to Asia to the Malay Peninsula, up to the Himalayan mountains of the kingdom of Bhutan, and we end our session in the afternoon with a trip to Philadelphia and Monaco. These are all, we will really explore the diversity and richness of royal textiles and also the displays and some of the behind the scenes conservation and preservation work that takes place in order to actually study and display such you know, delicate um, textiles. None of these talks are technical. Uh, they're not case studies, rather they're really, it's going to profile our work as conservators and preservationists in a much larger context of history and materials, structure use, and the challenges we face also um, presenting and conserving textile artifacts that belong to living monarchs. So I want to introduce who is with me right here, and on my left is Kun J, well, Dr. J, um, who is a senior researcher and a program director at Simeo Spafa and has produced an incredible book on the architecture, the traditional architecture of Pre, Pre province in the north of Thailand. And um, Yao, Yawarat, on the far left, who is a conservator at the Queen Sariket. Museum of Textiles, and she will start this afternoon with our first talk. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I would like to introduce the history and manufacture of Sir Krui. Sir Krui is a Thai word, means robe. Members of Thai royal court have worn Sir Krui as the full dress uniform since ancient times. They have dressed in the special occasions such as the royal ceremonies and the grand audience or the important event. This picture shows you the full dress costume of the high-ranking officer in Ayutthaya period in the, reign, in the reign of King Narai around the 17th century. They wore a shirt inside, a robe, and the conical hat we show their ranking. The official costume looks similar to the Persian costume. It might be some influence from Persian in Ayutthaya at that time. You can see at, in front of the cabinet, you can see French and Persian in front of the cabinet. That keep the manuscript elect they made from Lacke Lacque. And we can and we can see the official costume in many sources until the Ratanakosin period, around late the eighteenth century until today. This picture is from the mural painting in Ayutthaya period, King Narai. It looks similar to the, the first picture that I shown you, and this from the Pratinang Puthai Sawan at the National Museum, Bangkok. And from the mural painting and in the temple, not Photography in Thailand started around King Rama IV's period. So I will show you some photos of people wearing Sir Krui in many occasions. These pictures are His Majesty the King in the coronation ceremony. His Majesty wore the full dress costume for the king. He wearing the gold brocade, gold robe, and headdress. This is some photo that I shown you. 
and the tonsha ceremony, the king will want the robe. This picture is King Rama IV, and he is the King Rama V, and he is the King Rama V, and Crown Prince Vashirunahit. The this rite of passage ceremony is for children in the Brahmanism belief, and that. There are the tonsure costume for the prince in the different ranking. Circle is wrapped across the shoulder. You, you will see this. And in another occasion, these are the prince in the royal cremation ceremony. They are in the Deva costume style. The relationship for, to foreign country is the special occasion too. So the royal court will be in the full dress uniform in this occasion. You will see King Rama V wearing gold robe and hold the meerschaum pipe. And this the Siamese ambassador to London in the reign of King Rama IV and to France. And this is the Praya Yun Ching Cha or the Lord of the Ceremony in the Swing Ceremony at the Giant Swing and the Plowing Ceremony. He wearing the robe too. And this is the sample of the royal family in King Rama IV period, that he wearing the robe for taking a picture. And this is the high-ranking officer in King Rama IV period. When King Rama V established many decorations, so the full dress uniform have to decorate the insignia on the robe too. People who received the decoration had to prepare their costume by themselves. They had to make a, the robe in their ranking and the star in their decoration to decorate on the left side of the robe. This is the sample of the high-ranking officer that wear the robe and, and his decoration. He attacked the star on his robe. But sometimes the king will give the costume for the governor who were the king of the city or some foreigner of it. This is the last governor of Chiang Mai, Zhao Gao Naurat. He received the robe and the costume from the king, King Rama the Sikh too. And this is the foreign advisor in the reign of King Rama V. Zhao Praya Apai Rasha, Gustav Roland Jackman, a William lawyer, and Praya Sholayut Yotin, Andre Duplessis, the Richelieu, a Navy, and Praya Mahithorn, a lawyer from Japan. In 1941, wearing robe with decoration were cancelled. The present day have not to wearing robe just in the special ceremony, such as the grand audience of the king and some royal ceremony. This picture is King Pumipon Aduliyadev or King Ramanai. He wore this robe in the occasion that Sixty anniversary, <coughs> and this the crown prince Vashila Longkorn, and the occasion in 
in present time the uh, flowering ceremony and the grand audience of the king. So I will present the manufacture of circuitry. In Thai tradition, there are many rules for ranking. So circuitry has the ranking too. Gold is valuable, so the royal family's robe is all gold. And the officer's robe must be combined with the cotton too and gold. The robes made from ground tong or gold netting and embroidery. Ground tong is not only for the man's robe but also for the high ranking lady too. This is the queen's wicked dress that made from gong tong and embroidery. And the sad in the order of Zulajom Glau, decoration and go back. This is the pattern of Sir Krui. This style is for the officer. It had five pieces two at front, two sleeve, and one at back, and has the gold net in, in the cuff, shoulder, the neck, and the hem. But if in, if belong to the royal family and the king, will has in the, along the torso. Long Hong is a high technique that was only used in the royal court. Here is Zhao Zhong Sadap Ladawan, the last consort of King Rama V. She was an ex expert to make Long Tong. When the king passed away, she left the grand palace. When she got older, Princess Lin Thorn asked her to teach lady in inner court to make Long Tong because the princess wanted to preserve this handicraft, so she she's back to the inner court again and touch the lady. This is her tool to make long tong. And her long tong, that's now is belong to Princess Slinton at her museum. This is the knot, the long tong knot. It's made from the gold trade that the metal, the metal, the metal the wrapped, wrap the, wrap the thread, the seal thread. It looks similar to the fishing net, fishing net, and the heel trip back, akha and kamu. You can see that. <laughs> we'll leave it up here so people can look at it. After they prepare the ground tong, they will embroider it by many, many material. By they, they use the pe pe pattern paper on the ground tong and embroidery on, on the ground tong. This is the symbol of the embroidery on circuit. They use seal thread and metal thread and bitter wing and sequins and another that make it beautiful. And sometimes it had Thai style and sometimes maybe it, they will embroider it in European style too. This is the sample of the embroidered on cotton tool. And this is the technique of the, to make the border on below, below the, the rope. They will attach the corner and embroider it again on top to make the pattern match. 
and this is the conservation been uh, is the old method for preserve the cruy the sir cruy it they will make the cotton muslin or the cotton fabric or muslin to make the wrapper to save from the dust to keep clean and to keep oxidation. oxidation prevent to prevent oxidation It's the last. <laughs> this is the history of circuit for short. Uh, I would like to thank for lady in the inner court for the information about circuit and Bangkok National Museum for some photos collection. Thank you. So Yao really covered a lot of the history and the technique um, of making the sua krui, and you can see that there are two different types. One is made completely of gold thread, and the entire robe um, is constructed of that and embroidered on top, and that's for royalty. And then the ones for um, high officials are uh, the body of the robe is made of uh, like a bridal tool or netting, and then the, um, the side panels, etc., are the gold net and then embroidered. So we have two different types, and I'm going to continue now for a few moments to profile um, an extraordinary robe, uh, which is of the official, the official style. So it's a combination of the, the netting and the gold net. Should I trade places with you? Is that okay? <laughs> So, um, this is actually the story of uh, Admiral Duplessis de Richelieu, who, um, whose Thai name is Praya uh, Cholayut Yotin, and this is the uh, photograph of him from quite early. He came to Siam under the reign of Rama V, um, and he served as uh, the king's, well, first as a naval advisor and he was asked to map um, actually the coastal areas of Thailand and off the coast of the Andaman Sea um, there are some a series of islands that are named the Richelieu Islands after him and um, you know like his colleague um, Jacobin the Belgian and Masao from Japan they came as foreigners in a capacity to serve the king and in the case of the Admiral, he stayed for um, over 25 years. And he eventually became Commander-in-Chief of the Royal Thai Navy. And so he was given a robe by King Rama V uh, upon the completion of his duties. So this is an honorific robe uh, in the style for a high official. Um, and so here's uh, Rama V pictured and the Admiral. Um, what's, and here are photographs of them traveling together. They were, became um, very close friends. We know from reading letters and correspondence uh, when the Admiral returned back to Denmark in 1902 or 3. Um, shown here, they're traveling on their way to Java. Um, the Admiral actually was the uh, chief uh, commander of the, the beautiful yacht you've seen pictured earlier today. And here they are again taking a break in Songkla. The admiral is uh, to the far right, just behind, um, on the far right. So you can see that they had a very rich and long friendship. Um, and finally, the admiral had a, a, a lot of um, influence here in Thailand because he helped found the East um, East Asiatic Company, he brought trolleys, electrification, um, he was, uh, provided the first electrical generators to the Grand Palace, 
um, shipped in the marble from Italy for Benjamin Bopit Temple here in Bangkok. And so it's, um, it's an extraordinary testament that this robe has now come back to Thailand. And each of you actually have in your, in your bag a really beautiful little booklet that was provided to you from Mr. Norman, who is the current owner of this robe. So here you see the robe when it first came back from Denmark and on its 1970s mannequin. And then here's when it's now installed on a slant in a case in a private, private gallery that's available to people to look at. So um, it's, it's very clear that the robe was made specifically for the Admiral. Many of the robes that you saw pictured before are more generic designs, or they're either Thai vine-like designs, or Nagas and Kinnery and whatnot, but generic and generic floral designs. But this one is quite specific with anchors, ship's wheel, captain's hat, oars, other nautical um, insignia. And it really does reflect his profession and status and the duty to Rama V. So it's a story of a big circle. Um, it's a really important artifact and a piece of Thai Danish history. And I think that uh, everyone is extremely grateful to Mr. Norman for being able to bring this robe back to Thailand. Um, and he was able to um, acquire it from the admiral's descendants um, so that it could come back to a country of origin where it's much more important than ending up in a private collection in another country of the world. So conservation involved several phases, com comprehensive treatment and document documentation and examination. In terms of supplies, uh, I ended up sourcing things from New York and France because I, needed, I wanted to find sequins and gold bullion and soutache that was um, antique and it was already oxidized because if I put bright gold new ones on, it would be too obvious. And in this case, I was actually restoring some of the lost design and pattern so that the robe overall would look complete. So the work was done, two focuses. Um, stabilization, so that it could be well supported, and then restoration to some of the pattern where a lot of the um, embroidered elements were simply gone. So here a detail you see of me working, yes, on the floor. <laughs> I later moved to a table, and then uh, we had to, I had to do repairs to the netting, and that was one component of it, and then also repairs to all of the embroidered elements. So here is an example of one large flower that was gone. All of the embellishment was gone, so all of that was added back on by following the pattern in other flowers. Again, a, a floral area. But by and large, I was quite fortunate. This robe is in extraordinarily good condition because uh, the admiral himself and then later his family kept it in a bank vault for nearly 100 years. So not only was it, it was only worn during the admiral's lifetime for a short period of time. Most of the wear and tear evident on it was more on the right-hand side, so we can assume he was right-handed. But then it stayed in a cold, dark, um, clean environment where it did not oxidize. So it is really a stunning robe. The second part after the actual restoration and repair was making a supportive insert so that the front and the back of the robe would be separated and the neckline would be supported. And it would give it a little bit of depth of field because we couldn't display it three-dimensionally on a mannequin um, because it's what we call an inherent vice the fact that this very heavy gold metallic embroidery is on bridal net, uh, if you hang it, it simply doesn't last. It is destined to fall apart. So the only way to really display this for a long period of time was to put it on an angle and protect it in a case. So this was the solution that um, I came up with and worked in, in collaboration with um, the client, the owner. It has a very fine uh, silk gossamer lining as well. And then you can see the detail of sort of a clerical collar that helps to hold the collar um, up. The next phase was designing a case. We collaborated with a colleague from the Smithsonian Institute who designed the case, sent the specs to Thailand, and a marvelous 
casemaker here in Bangkok constructed the case. And here we all are, about to, about to actually install the robe. It's held in place underneath the arms and along the bottom edge with glass bumpers. Um, and so it, it is on a slant, but we had to prevent it from sliding within the case. So here it is just before installation. And a few more details, and as you can see, the um, insignia that's attached to the robe that's actually made of thread, gold thread, and um, embroidered. And here it is finally installed in the case, which Mr. Norman very cleverly had uh, input in the design to say that he would like the back of it visible. So there are reflective mirrors on the back to show the full, the full pattern on the, on the back as well as the front. And there's Mr. Norman. Thank you, and my sincere thanks to Mr. Norman for letting me do this amazing treatment and also continue to do publications and presentations and to the museum and everyone else for supporting this um, historical research. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kunya Walak and Julia, for the very interesting presentation. Next, I would like to invite the next three speakers to come up on stage, please. We'll keep the um, Q&A session at the end of the afternoon. So if you have any questions for uh, any of the speakers, please uh, make note and then keep them until we have time. Yes, the next uh, speaker here is Miss um, Elizabeth Olibi Thompson, a uh, textile conservator from Historic Royal Palaces from the UK. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so, yes, my name's Libby, and I'm a textile conservator for Historic Royal Palaces based at Hampton Court Palace. Historic Royal Palaces is an independent charity that look. Am I not loud enough? Is that better? Hang on. There we go, that's better. Historic Royal Palaces is an independent charity that looks after five royal, five royal palaces in and around London. And I have been part of a 30-strong team of conservators that care for these palaces and their collections for just over four years. And in that time, I've been lucky enough to work on this absolutely stunning object, Princess Charlotte's wedding dress. Although previous conservation treatments had allowed the dress to be displayed in the past, when it came to us in 2011, it was found that some of the older treatments were failing and that new problems had developed. This resulted in it being unstable and in need of treatment before exhibition. So I'd like to share some of the treatment undertaken on the object and also our mounting solution for it. Princess Charlotte's wedding dress dates from 1816 when she married Leopold of Saxe-Coburg. Charlotte was the only daughter of George IV and heir to the throne after him. However, tragically she died a year after the wedding in childbirth at the age of just 21, with England losing two heirs to the throne. And I feel that this makes this dress quite a poignant memory of her life that was tragically cut short. And you can see that the style of this dress is quite different to what we associate with Western weddings, the typical white wedding dress. Royal weddings were primarily political transactions, and this dress really reflects the importance of this, and the importance and wealth of the person wearing it. We see dresses made almost entirely from precious metals, such as gold, and in this case, silver. They are highly decorative, however this juxtaposition of fine silks and heavy metals can often cause complex conservation problems. The dress is a typical empire line dress consisting of five separate pieces, all of which have elements of silver within them. Both cloth of silver and a silk net embroidered extensively with silver lame or silver strips. And I've put them here in order that they would go on the mannequin or on the body. So first is a silver foil underskirt, then a silk net and silver strip embroidered overskirt, and an apron of the same material that sits on the front of this. 
Then there is a bodice, which is again the silk net with the embroidery. And finally, a train, which is silver foil with a silk net scalloped trim. And this rather lovely picture shows you the delicacy of the embroidery and the shell design on the edging. There are also crosses of silver evenly spaced throughout all the net elements of the dress. And it also shows the shine and the brightness of the silver, which is really amazing considering the dress is nearly 200 years old. And we think this brightness is due in part to the purity of the silver, but also to the favourable preservation conditions it has been kept in whilst in storage and on display. And I put this slide in yesterday, actually, after visiting the QSMT and seeing this court jacket on display. I'm no textile historian, but both me and Julia couldn't help but notice similarities in the silver strip embroidery on both objects. This jacket is thought to be Indian made for the Thai court, dated later at circa 1850. But I thought it was interesting to see this very similar technique on these two objects and wondered if there was a connection between Charlotte's dress and more Eastern textile te techniques and materials. So although the dress is very bright, the combination of a fragile silk net and heavy silver metal causes a lot of tension. And consequently, the, silver, the weight of the silver was causing the silk net to split in places. And the microscopic picture at the top here shows this silk net breaking. This is not such a problem when the dress is flat and beautifully padded in storage. But when we wanted to display the dress, the fear was that the weight of the silver would cause the net to rip further whilst it was hanging. And the bottom picture highlights that although the silver is shiny, there is still micro-corrosion of the metal to consider. Because of this very fragile silk net, we have spent nearly 800 hours over the last few years preparing the dress for just a six-month display at the Royal Pavilion in Brighton. When the dress came to us for treatment, it had already received two previous conservation treatments, one in 1969 and one in 1997. This is something that is quite common in conservation and must inform our formulation of an appropriate treatment for an object. We have to take into account the reversibility of failing treatments and create a method that marries with previous treatments that are still holding well. In this case, some areas of the dress already had a nylon net support on the underside mirroring the construction of the original dress. These were designed to take some of the strain away from the original silk and it was decided that this treatment should continue in other untreated areas of the dress. In some areas, patches of net had been used rather than a full backing, and they were no longer providing sufficient support as the net was continuing to degrade around the patches. The existing problem would have continued if extra patches were applied. So the decision was taken to reverse the patch treatment and apply a full nylon net support in these areas. And this image shows an example of this patch removal and the splitting in the silk net revealed underneath indicated with the red arrow. This example is taken from the border of the overskirt. The main body of the overskirt already had a full stitch net support treatment. Pinning the support net into place on the underside of the object was very tricky and was firstly done on the flat, but we found that the object also needed to hang in order to prevent any distortions in the fall of the dress that the support material might create. Whilst aligning the grain of the silk and nylon net, it quickly became clear that replicating the small pleats in the border, circled here in red, with the nylon net was very difficult, as the nylon was not as malleable as the silk. The pleats were also difficult to see from the reverse, and clear access to the inside of the skirt was limited whilst it was hanging. Therefore, the nylon was laid on the front of the border, and the pleats tacked into place and corresponding tailor tacks were used to mark their locations on the border. It could then be aligned effectively on the underside. It was then stitched in place using very thin silk monofilament thread, which is almost invisible on this object. The stitching was done in grid formation to evenly spread the weight of the silver, and these grid lines have been highlighted in the above image. And you can see that every other line extends up into the main body of the skirt, and these actually marry up to the existing grid support stitching that's in place. A similar treatment was undertaken on the apron, although the apron had not previously been treated. 
The apron was of particular concern because of the rouleau, which is the circular trim in the center, adding weight and potentially damaging the apron further. In order to undertake this treatment, it was necessary to remove the replica net bodice that is marked here. It is thought that this bodice is part of the 97 treatment that was added to the dress to help mount it. And detailed thread analysis done in different areas of the apron showed that the stitching holding the apron onto the bodice was not original. The position of the bodice was marked on the apron with a stitch line. However, there was also an area of pleating on the proper left side of the apron marked here in red, which needed to be considered. In order to give the apron a full support, these pleats had to be removed. However, they are an important part of the structure of the dress and may hold contextual information about the construction techniques or later alterations, possibly caused by the changing shape of the wearer. Therefore, their position and formation had to be preserved, and this was done carefully with documentation. This is the area ungathered, and again, you can see the sort of damage that was occurring in the main body of the net, highlighted again with a red arrow. And here is the area ungathered again. Bear with me. And here is the area again with the new nylon net support pinned into place. And like the overskirt, stitching was done in a grid formation running vertically down. And the gathers at the top of the apron were recreated with close reference being carefully made to the documentation. And it was fixed back onto the replica bodice using the stitch guidelines. This treatment is almost invisible, which is why it is difficult to show you before and after pictures. But we felt it was particularly successful as, although it was technically quite difficult, we created an incredibly subtle full support system for the dress whilst it was hanging. I also wanted to highlight the treatment that was undertaken on the train. Overall, the silver foil material was in very good condition and was not in need of treatment. But the train trim, which was again the silk net and silver embroidery, was in poor condition. This was mainly due to the fact that elements of the dress had previously had two adhesive treatments, the first in 1969 and a later one in 1997, reversing the older treatment. And the later treatment was holding very well. However, the train trim still had the previous 1969 treatment in place, and this was failing badly and not offering any support to the degrading object. Therefore, the trim was removed from the train and you can see that process being undertaken in these slides. However, it was felt that some investigation into the previous adhesive treatment and its possible reversal was necessary. It was difficult to take samples from the original silk net of the trim, so samples were used from the 1969 nylon support net. And the image at the top is a microscopic picture of the control net, and some kind of adhesive residue can be clearly seen within the lattice of the net. Soaking the net in water was found to swell the adhesive, but not removing it. Soaking the net in acetone, a solvent, had varying effects dependent on soak time. The samples were soaked for sequentially longer periods of time. 20 minutes were needed to completely dissolve the adhesive. Soaking for shorter time periods actually proved detrimental, as the adhesive was reactivated and redeposited on the net, which can be seen in the bottom picture. However, soaking the object for 20 minutes in a solvent was not really a viable option, so an alternative method was found in removing the adhesive residue, dripping water on the sample for three minutes to swell the adhesive, then dripping acetone on the object for five minutes to remove the adhesive and wash it away so that it could not redeposit. And the top image shows the net after this treatment. However, this treatment appeared to be ineffective on the net taken from the object as it was found to be coated in starch, and the starch made it very difficult to evaluate if there was a significant adhesive residue present on the trim, if it was being removed, or if the treatment was affecting the starch layer. With this amount of uncertainty as to the value of the treatment, it was concluded that no solvent treatment should be undertaken on this part of the object. However, this testing was not in vain. It will prove very useful in the future, as we have objects with very similar problems of failing adhesives within our collection, and this method could prove to be very appropriate for those. So once the trim was removed from the train, it was found that the previous support net could be carefully peeled away. And you can see a segment of the trim lying on the new nylon support net and just how fragmentary it is. There were areas of loss in the net where nothing was holding the silver embroidery together in places. 
It was aligned on the new support net and sandwiched and stitched into place. It was then popped back onto the train. And here is an image of the trim on display. So I'd like to finally discuss a little about the mounting of the dress. The first time that I mounted this dress for display was in 2011 for a media-only event to mark the royal wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Due to the display being for a very limited time, just two weeks, we used an old-style fiberglass mannequin. This was actually a mannequin for another of Charlotte's younger dresses in the collection, and so was of a slightly smaller size than the wedding dress. Consequently, the bust of the dress was significantly larger than the mannequin, and the shoulders of the dress were broader. Due to the nature of the fiberglass mannequin, the décolletage could not be padded. The bust had to be lowered to stop a large gap forming between the bodice neckline and mannequin surface. This meant that the waistline of the bodice was not completely in its correct position. You can see that indicated in the pictures on the right-hand side. But this was felt to be a safe compromise for a short display. And I wanted to show this old style mannequin and the display effect that it gives. This type of mannequin was favored by historic royal palaces in past displays, showing the royal objects on mannequins that mirror the appearance of the royal figures that they belong to. And here are two more examples, Queen Victoria on the left in her Privy Council dress and Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II in her wedding gown on the right. However, with mounting royal costume, we have moved into a much more neutral style of presentation. This is how we presented the dress in its most recent exhibition at the Royal Pavilion, Brighton. The dress was going to be mounted on a papier-mâché mannequin. However, fo however, following research, papier-mâché mannequins are now only used for short-term display at historic royal palaces due to potential off-gassing. Even, even though this exhibition was for six months, the large amount of silver in the dress meant it was more vulnerable to gaseous pollutants. So it was decided that a perspex mannequin would be more suitable as the acrylic they are made of is inert and would therefore not off-gas. We also chose to use this cut-away style of mannequin, which is designed to create the illusion that the dress is free-hanging. The neckline of the mannequin is cut away to mirror the neckline of the dress, and the visible acrylic on the inside of the neck is covered in a silk material to imply that it is the lining of the dress. The mannequin is, in effect, invisible. It is great from a conservation point of view, as it is inert, but also shows the dress to its best potential with no implications about the appearance of the wearer, which could be distracting from the construction materials and historic style of the dress. We also chose this type of mannequin from a conservation point of view because you are able to alter the acrylic to suit the dress. And here you can see that process taking place. We used a toile, which is a cambric copy of the bodice, and used it to create a mannequin that fit it perfectly. Then we cover the mannequin in calico, which is padded into, and this is then covered in the silk. Then we make underpinnings to create the correct historic profile and proper support. And here again is the finished product on the right. Princess Charlotte's dress treatment highlights the idea that when we come to objects as conservators, we often have to formulate treatment plans that accommodate or reverse older treatments. With the progression of treatments, new materials being developed and scientific analysis developing and the textiles themselves continuing to degrade, textile conservation is never a static profession and that's one of the main things that I enjoy about it. Because of its materials, the dress is a really rare survival and I feel very lucky to have worked on it and ensured that it lasts a little bit longer for future generations to enjoy. Overall, the conservation treatment undertaken has allowed this very delicate object to go on display in a way that promoted its natural beauty and regality without compromising on the safety and support of the object. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And um, after this, we'll go from the UK to Singapore. So please welcome the next uh, speaker, Ms. Miki Komatsu from the Heritage Conservation Center in Singapore. Uh, I also would like to mention that one of uh, QSMT staff members, Ms. Biamon, who is sitting right here in the front, just returned from an internship at the Heritage Conservation Center in Singapore.
afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I will speak about the recent conservation project of Paranakan Chinese wedding garments and textile hangings for a wedding chamber, which were used for the traditional wedding ceremony. The Paranakan wedding ceremony was a grand, extravagant, and very costly occasion. The colorful wedding chamber and robes typify the rich and vibrant culture of the Paranakans in Singapore and Malaysia. My talk today will have three parts. I will start with brief introduction to the Paranakan culture, then followed by two case studies. Before I start, let me introduce my, our conservation center. Heritage Conservation Center is an institution of the National Heritage Board in Singapore. It was established in 2000 with two departments of conservation and collection management. The center is a purpose-built facility with uh, two departments. The center is a purpose-built facility with 25 dedicated collection stores and four conservation labs. HCC houses the National Collections of National Heritage Board that operates more than 10 museums and heritage institutions. So, who are the Paranakans? For centuries, the riches of Southeast Asia brought foreign traders to the region. While many returned to their homelands, some remained behind, marrying local women. The Malay term Paranaka means locally born. The Malays used the term to refer to the descendant of overseas immigrants and women in the Malay archipelago. They developed a hybrid culture which mixes both sides of their ancestral culture, some aspect of European culture uh, were absorbed during colonial times as well. Many different communities are recognized as Paranakan, for example. The term Paranakan is commonly associated today with those of Chinese descent, also known as straight Chinese for those in British colonies of Singapore, Malacca, and Penang. Large Paranakan Chinese communities can be found today in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. There are over 10 Paranakan associations in the Asia Pacific region, including Phuket and Australia. My talk will focus on the Paranakan Chinese of Singapore and Malacca today. There are also para other Paranakan communities such as Indian Hindu Paranakans, Indian Muslim Paranakans, and Eurasian Paranakans. The Paranakans Chinese of Singapore trace their Chinese ancestry to Southern China immigrants who had settled in Malacca in Penang, on the west coast of what is now Peninsular Malaysia. Some Singapore families also trace their ancestry from southern China to towns throughout the Indonesian islands, such as Medan in Sumatra and Maslan, Serama, Semaran in Java, where they may have resided for several generations before settling in Singapore. Paranakan Chinese are important in the trade, politics, and civic life of the British Strait settlements. The mid-19th to early 20th century especially was considered a golden age for many Paranakan families. The Paranakans are merchant class. They become very influential and were elite of Singapore. That sets the context where most of the artifacts discussed in my presentation was made. So this first case study is about the conservation and installation of a wedding bed and textile hangings. One of the museums we support is the Paranakan Museum, which aims to showcase the lifestyle of the Paranakan Chinese community. A focal point of the, the museum is the bridal chamber, which portrays the rich ceremonial aspect of this community. Therefore, the important conservation project was carefully planned and prepared with close consultation with the curator. Unlike modern wedding ceremonies, which last only for a day or two, Paranakan weddings were extravagant affairs with a typical traditional wedding 
going on for 12 days. The important ritual of the Paranakan Chinese wedding took place in a carefully arranged setting of the bridal chamber. In fact, the chamber was designated as a background for several important rituals, such as those listed here. The bridal bed itself played an essential role, serving as a symbolic vehicle for the bright future of the two families brought together by the marriage. Paranakan Museum had on display for many years the Penang style Paranakan bed, which could finally be rotated after the museum acquired a Malacca style two piece bed. Typically part of the bridal trousseau, wedding beds used by the Paranakans in Singapore and Malaysia up to the early 20th century were usually made of namut, lacquered in auspicious red and gilded. They are often made in China for wealthy Paranakan livings in the British Strait settlements and were a symbol of the wealth and status of the bridal family. Wedding beds were often lavishly decorated with silk curtains, beadwork, and embroidery. This is a reflection of the Paranakan's love of ornamentation. The wedding bed on the right slide came from Malacca and were probably made in the early 20th century. It is said that the Paranakan Chinese family in Singapore and Malacca had two beds for the weddings, a day bed and night bed, usually of matching design. These bed and a complete set of textiles belong formally to the family of Shalon Chi. This is very rare for families to still have all the silk textiles. They were used for at least five weddings in Malacca over three generations. The Chi family is one of the oldest documented families in Singapore and Malacca, having arrived in Malacca in about 1710. The project began a year before the rotation in early 2011. That was when all the artifacts were acquired from Malacca and delivered to our center. After the accessioning process, the wooden beds, together with the complete set of textile hangings, totaling 81 parts, were assessed by the conservators. As part of our new acquisition process, they were sent for anoxic treatment as a precautionary measure against suspected pest infestation before being put in the respective stores. After the confirmation of the rotation schedule, it took about six months to prepare for hangings for display. There were 20 textiles in total to be displayed, including a curtain for the night bed, a pair of tie-shaped hangings for the front panels, bed spread, mattress liner, and a gold flower basket. All the textiles were heavily embellished on colorful silk damask with Peking knot embroidery. Auspicious motifs such as phoenix, peonies, and eight Taoist mortal butterflies, dragons, and chi lins were incorporated into the design since these were believed to protect the newlyweds from evil spirits and also embody the concept of fatality and wealth. Detailed assessment of the condition and research into their history, original usage, technique, material played an important role in the conservation proposal and planning for mounting and installation. Every piece was fragile and delicate and thus required careful and minimum handling as well as extensive treatment for contextual display. Majority of the textile has suffered damage from pest infestation, resulting in their instability. However, more challenges were faced in the mounting and installation process of these hangings rather than in the actual conservation treatment for this project. Film and photographs from the archives showing the wedding of Mrs. Shalon Chi and her husband in 1994 and her parents in 1967 provided an overall presentation of dressed up bed. These were really helpful in planning any mounting needs and for the complex installation process. The museum curator was also of great help in understanding each textile and deciding how they should be showcased in the museum. Among the hangings, most challenging pieces was green bed curtain, measuring 8.5 meter wide and 2.2 meter in length for the night bed, 
Many questions were raised over how the Yazo fabric could be mounted safely without compromising its overall stability. There was no tie or string for securing to the bed frame. Unlike with the previous wedding chamber display, we did not have chance to see the assembled wedding beds, nor do test fitting for all the textile hangings in our laboratory. Therefore, the mounting method was made to be flexible and adjustable, which could be determined in situ during installation. Typically, when the flat textile is to be hung for display, a Velcro strap or an additional header cloth would be stitched on the top, of, top edge of the textile at the back. Those additional cloths are then attached to a strainer or a wall. Also, this is the header cloth. So adopting same concept, we decided to have a header cloth sewn to the top edge of the curtain, but with additional cotton ties so as to distribute the weight of the artifact and achieve the best fit around the three-dimensional structure. So we began by installing the night bed curtain first, as it was supposed to wrap around the entire night bed, which was to be placed at the back of the showcase. Installing the longest artifact for the chamber first would also help to minimize the risk of damaging other hangings during the installation. The other 90 pieces followed. How to pack and roll each textile dwelling transportation from the center to the museum was also carefully considered for smoother installation, ease of handling, and to maximize the limited space in the showcase. Curators also played a very important role in ensuring the appropriateness of the aesthetic presentation and detailed placement of each piece while the conservators ensure the structural stability of the object. The white header cloth on the right image shows the gap in places which are intentionally made in order to accommodate other hangings on the same beam because there are few layers of hanging which we have to share the same beam to display. Conservators also devised a unique method using nylon fishing line and PE tubing for displaying hanging, consisting of three ornaments and tassels for wedding bed display. Each ornament was first su supported by the looped strip of mylar. Then these mylar support are held by nylon string and PE tubing. The distance of tubing between each ornament was carefully arranged to be slightly shorter than the actual length so that the heavy ornaments are suspended by the nylon string, not by the actual structure of the silk thread. So here is the wedding bed with the complete set of hangings after installation. The successful collaboration with many stakeholders made this display possible. Next case study is about the conservation and mounting of Paranakan wedding couple display. The Paranakan Museum has had these Malacca style wedding garments on display since its opening in 2008. Gallery showcased the couple and then the page boy and girl in Chinese-like robe during the wedding procession, comp complemented by the wedding umbrellas. We were faced with mounting issues such as the appropriate of support given by the padded mannequins and their overall presentation. In 2012, when the wedding couple display was selected for the traveling show to South Korea, our conservation team took the opportunity to assess the condition of those garments and to improve the mannequin display. There are two requirements from the museum. First, to make it safe for the garment and mannequins to be exhibited for the show in Korea. And second, to use them for the permanent display after the traveling exhibition. Therefore, the team aimed to ensure the structural stability of the wedding robes for contextual display, as well as safe transportation. Additionally, we wanted to enhance the aesthetic presentation of the garments on mannequins for long-term display. Bridal wedding garments this style were predominantly used by the Paranakans of Malacca and Singapore from the late 19th century to early 20th century. This set of garments consists of various pieces, a top, a two-piece skirt, a five-layered cape with a tie-like hangings, 
and two forearm attachment. Headdress and gold jewelry complete the look. In addition, white cotton baju and bamboo vest were worn by both bride and groom. These served to protect the wedding garments from the perspiration that resulted from wearing the heavy and elaborate piece in tropical climate. This is the robe for the bride. It is an elaborately decorated upper garment made from silk damask with embroidery band at the sleeve, neck, hem, and carved opening. The robe is fully lined with a bright pink silk, which seems to be a Paranakan's favorite color. The robe is embroidered all over with motif of peony, phoenix, birds, and flowers in Peking knot embroidery technique. This bridal skirt has a front panel and at least 70 narrow pleats on each side of the skirt. Color of this skirt was a royal orange yellow, known in Malay as the yellow of the ripe beetle nuts. The most incredible of all are those which rich embroidery among the divided pleats. Because the skirt was worn with the knee-length rope, the panel were only embroidered up to the point where the jacket met the skirt. Many narrow pleats which widen towards the hem allow ease the movement, sewing, swinging gracefully as the bride walked. The Paranakan wedding ceremony was fundamentally Chinese, deriving from wedding tradition practiced up to the late 19th century in Fujian province in southern China. These costumes are usually custom made in China by highly skilled tailors and embroiderers. They are similar to those worn by Chinese women during Qin Dynasty period Manchu rule in China, shown here. Paranakan robe, on the other hand, has elongated sleeve but shows many similarities in terms of structure, type of embroidered symbols couched in gold thread such as phoenix and peonies. The positioning of each motif are almost identical. After the condition assessment of the garments, plus umbrella, decision was made to stabilize the condition of the garment further in order to make them safe for display, transport, handling by the staff overseas who might not have been familiar with the Paranakan artifact when it's traveled to the South Korea. Those garments for the bride and groom were generally in good condition, except for the minor holes and losses. However, the wedding umbrellas in the slide had many damages with previous repair, which needed conservation attention. The umbrella had been previously repaired crudely before our acquisition. This translucent cream silk is not supporting the fragile area beneath, but rather just covering the damage with a running stitch using a very thick white cotton thread. The cream silk overlay was removed first, and then the actual condition of the umbrella was assessed. As this picture shows, the embroidered border was severely damaged with major losses and shedding of the silk ground fabric. This also caused detached embroidery. Holes and losses were sandwiched with a dyed green silk patch beneath and a dyed nylon overlay. These two, la two layers of support were stitched on the inside of the losses so that the support layers could hold the fragmentary embroidery border in place without stitching the damaged, damaged green ground silk. The other aim of this treatment was to improve the overall presentation of the costume so as to showcase the bridal couple in the bride, uh, right historical context without compromising the safety of the garments. Naturalistic mounting is most relevant for those garments in relatively robust condition and designated to be displayed within the social historical context like this project. It is important to show how the costume appeared when originally worn may be displayed with associated accessories and jewelries to complete the outfit. Thus, picture research is important in helping to understand how the costumes were worn and how they look in real life. It is also essential to, in understanding the date of the costume, giving clues as to what may have been worn beneath the garment. To mount costume in a naturalistic way, emphasis needs to be on the shape of the underlying figures this is more relevant for Western costume, which 
has complex cutting made to fit closely to the body. In contrast, the Paranaka wedding garments are not tailored to the human figure, but are loose and square cut at the shoulder. Attempt to add extra padding to support the garments resulted in them looking unnatural and overstuffed like the previous display in the museum. Therefore, attempts are made after having discussion with curators, conservators, and mannequin suppliers. Firstly, to modify the arms, these bendable arms are better able to hold a long and heavy sleeve in position. The flexible and skinnier structure also facilitates the dressing process easier. Secondly, to add extra padding at the back in order to carry the weight of the garments. This helps to prevent dropping at the back of the robe. These are the images of mannequins after improvement were made to its shape and structure. Eventually, the bridal garments are displayed at the traveling show in Korea on the improved mannequin in March this year. Upon arriving back in Singapore after the exhibition in May, the garments and umbrella were finally returned home to our permanent gallery. Alternatively, when a costume presents particular challenges for mounting safely in a naturalistic context, more stylized form of mounting can be chosen. For example, for garment with a flat structure like a Paranakan rope, it will be more obvious to use T-bar or padded roller with inner padding to help the body of the costume to hang straight without creases and to give some suggestion of three-dimensional depth. This will also give evenly distributed support across the shoulder and neck. A further refinement of stylistic mounting for a very fragile costume would be to present in on a slope board with inner padding to add depth and reduce creasing. So in conclusion, ritual ceremonies like a wedding often have complex procedure and hidden meanings behind them. Conservation of those wedding textiles should aim not only at stabilizing their condition for display, but also preserving the contextual display associated with the textile in the best possible manner. This project also gave us an opportunity to study our Paranakan collections and pose more questions related to the object history, techniques, and materials, which are unfortunately no longer in use or have disappeared. True research on Paranakan textile, especially on embroidery and beadwork, will be essential for their long-term preservation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miki, and uh, also you know, Elizabeth for the last two very interesting presentations, which actually show us uh, the glimpses of uh, the works of the conservators that actually uh, some of us non-conservators might never have seen, and we don't know what um, is behind the display. And uh, for the next speaker, Julia is going to um, introduce her, because I think they're, Before that, they've known each other very well. So. so our next speaker comes from the Kingdom of Bhutan, and Siring Uden Pentor is a senior curator at the Textile Museum, and she will talk about royal costumes and, and um, one of the more novel solutions of, of conservation, which is anoxic storage, oxygen-free storage. Thank you, Julia. Good afternoon. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, preserving the Wong Chuk Dynasty's royal textiles, treatments, display parameters, and anoxic storage at the Textile Museum in Bhutan. Uh, I'll also be talking a little bit about Bhutanese textiles in general, because I think um, many here are not familiar with uh, our, our, our textiles. Uh, Bhutan is a constitutional monarchy. Uh, the, uh, the Wangchuk dynasty was established in 1907 after the first king, Gonsor Ugin Wangchuk, consolidated the local chieftains and took over the Dharma Rajas, who were the reincarnations of the Shabdungs who founded Bhutan in 1616. We are relatively a very young monarchy. Um, The Textile Museum of Bhutan has been founded under the royal patronage of Her Majesty the Queen Mother, Ajisangi Chodun Wangchuk. 
Bhutanese textiles have often been referred to as one of the large major arts of Asia to recently gain international recognition. Many fine examples of Bhutanese textiles were being lost to private collectors, textile enthusiasts, and museums all over the world. This was due to the fact that there was no institution in Bhutan at a national level actively collecting and preserving Bhutanese textiles. There was also a very real danger of the loss of intricate patterns which the weavers were no longer weaving as it was deemed too difficult. Her Majesty conceived the idea of a textile museum uh, early in the, in the early 1990s. Bhutan's first textile museum was inaugurated in June, built to showcase Bhutanese textiles in traditional settings under the auspices of the Department of Culture. Building on the success of the first museum, Her Majesty realizing the need of a facility that would meet international standards of museums and to address all issues related to textiles and the art of weaving in Bhutan, led to the establishment of the Royal Textile Academy, which was recently inaugurated in June 2013. I'll talk a little bit about the national costume of Bhutan also. Panels of woven cloth are cut and stitched to make the go and the kira. The go is the national dress for the man, and the woman uh, wear the kira. The national costumes are to have said to be promulgated by the great Shabdung, uh, uh, the founder of Bhutan as a nation state. The dress was intended to give Bhutanese a distinct identity and has in time become a symbol of our national identity. Woven textiles are also used for making a variety of utilitarian and ceremonial items for daily use in the lives of ordinary men and women, as well as the elite and the clergy. The use of cloth thus transcends social and political parameters. Nevertheless, different kinds of cloth and different ways in which they are used reflect societal norms and etiquette in Bhutan. The use of Chinese brocade is very uh, prevalent in the religious and sacred textiles. Here we have the mass dancers performing at the religious ceremonies known as the tichus, which are held in every district at certain uh, 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 times of the year. We also, uh, uh, there's representation of a lot of applique and embroidery in Bhutanese sacred uh, art. Uh, this one is displayed only once a year. It's an applique tondril with uh, some embroidery of the Guru Padma Sambhava. Uh, this is displayed only once a year at a religious festival called the Parathechu. Uh, it's suspended on the wall of the monastery, so it's really quite huge. Uh, before the advent of Buddhism, uh, uh, the Bhutanese are said to have uh, practiced Bonism. And um, this is a ceremonial uh, tunic, actually a part of a ceremonial tunic, the rest of it is missing. A part of the uh, ceremonial tunic which is used by shaman priests uh, while invoking the local deities. This is yet another example of the Buddha Sakyamuni in applique. Accessory textiles also uh, 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 are very uh, uh, made of cloth in Bhutan. We've got our boots. Now, the, the, this particular boot that you're looking at belonged to His Majesty, the present King of Bhutan, Jigme uh, Gyesar Namgyal Wangchuk, when he was a crown prince. Now, the patch that you see out here, which is orange, uh, is, uh, signifies the status uh, or the uh, uh, rank of uh, the men in, in society. Uh, this color was worn by him while he was the crown prince, which is an orange, usually worn by ministers. He would now be wearing a yellow uh, uh, patch on his ankle. Even the ceremonial scarves uh, that are worn by the woman in the, roi uh, the royal woman, uh, this, is a, so this is a pattern which is very um, uh, similar to ones found on ceremonial lap covers, which I'll show you later on. Uh, the reason why this particular uh, inclusion had been made for the ceremonial shoulder scarf is because 
uh, women in Bhutan, not common uh, uh, lay women in Bhutan, would wear the shoulder scarf on the left side of the sh uh, shoulder, much like the sabai here in Thailand. <laughs> All right. Uh, much like the sabai here in Thailand, but uh, the royal women would wear this draped around their shoulders. This is an example of a belt. I'm going to go really quickly now. So. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is an example of the royal crown. Now, the crown, in, the royal crown, the crown of the monarchs in Bhutan is actually the raven crown. However, our monarchs uh, had many crowns for different occasions which uh, 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 had uh, 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 during, for ceremonial purposes. This is a woman's jacket. Uh, this is an example of a throne cover. You can see a lot of Buddhist symbols in this, uh, the dragon, the Garuda, and then uh, the, the eight-spoked uh, eight spoked wheel also. Now, I was telling you about the ceremonial lap cover. This is what I was referring to. The, this diamond-shaped pattern is usually seen only in the Chasipanke, which is uh, uh, used by the nobility uh, uh, for ceremonial purposes. Uh, these are examples of carry bags. Uh, in Bhutan, we use a lot of wool uh, due to the, uh, the cold climatic conditions that we come from. We also work with, uh, uh, nomad, uh, with uh, yak hair, the nomadic yak herders up in the north. They do a lot of work with uh, uh, yak hair too. There are two kinds of looms um, that uh, exist in Bhutan. One is the backstrap loom and one is the horizontal frame loom. Uh, uh, the different kinds of weaves that we see in Bhutan, uh, clockwise, this pl a plain weave would be known as the Shadima. Then we have something with uh, Tibetan influence called the Hota. Then we have the plain weave, which is the Thara, then plaids, which is the Pangtsi and Mata. And this is worn by the nomadic yak herders. Uh, and uh, this would be something that would be worn by the monk body. Um, the the uh, uh, sapma or supplementary warp patterns in Bhutan, we differentiate each uh, uh, weave gets a name depending on the colors that the warp pattern bands have been woven for supplementary warp pattern textiles. Something with a combination of yellow and white warp pattern bands would be known as an aikabru. We we see a uh, we see a plain aikabru here, but then something that has uh, supplementary weft patterns in uh, alternating with the warp bands would be known as a shinglo chem. Uh, the warp pattern bands are wo uh, woven in, uh, in, in threes, three cross hatches, six, nine, and can extend up to 15. Uh, this would be known, the co color combination here of gold uh, warp pattern bands with the red field would be known as, as a mensimata and something like this with a green alternating with the red would be known as the lucema. Now, this is a very unique uh, pattern that is found in Bhutan. Uh, the supplementary discontinuous weft patterns. I've seen uh, a lot of textiles in Southeast Asia that uh, are uh, uh, supposed, uh, deemed to be supplementary discontinuous weft patterns. However, there is a, sp sorry, there is a pattern in Bhutan that most experts until recently thought it was impossible to create on a backstrap loom. That's because it res resembles chain stitch in embroidery. It, you can't see it really well out here, but um, um, uh, you have to take my word for it. <laughs> okay. uh, of recent... Um, the most recent royal event of uh, great significance to the Kingdom of Bhutan was the royal wedding of His Majesty the King Jigmegisar Namgyal Wangchuk to Her Majesty the Queen Jitsin Pema Wangchuk on November 1st, 2012. For the first time ever in the history of Bhutan, royal wedding textiles actually left the palace grounds and were loaned to the Textile Museum of Bhutan to be showcased in an exhibition dedicated to the royal family. The yellow, uh, uh, the, the event took place in a, uh, within a span of three days. 
The most important day would be uh, the religious ceremony that took place in uh, the old capital city of Bhutan called Punakha. His Majesty wore a yellow brocade go with floral patterns and met metallic embellishments. Uh, their Majesties, the kings, uh, uh, oh, sorry, this go belonged to the second king of Bhutan, which would be his great grandfather, who also wore it for his wedding to Her Majesty Prince of Chodun Wangchuk. The color yellow in Bhutan is representative of royalty. Uh, uh, their Majesties, the kings, wear yellow ceremonial scarves. This color is also used on their ankle, like I mentioned earlier. Then uh, Her Majesty, okay, this, this is a close-up of the yellow uh, brocade go. Um, and we also spoke about the raven crown, uh, the crown earlier. This is the crown that was worn for the royal wedding. Uh, this is the raven crown of Bhutan, which the present king is using. This uh, was um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the kira that Her Majesty wore for her wedding ceremony, uh, the, for the religious ceremony in Punakha. This is uh, uh, an example of supplementary warp pattern bands alternating with discontinuous weft uh, pattern, patterns. You can see um, uh, uh, symbols that look very Chinese. Uh, which uh, geometric patterns which are incorporated in Bhutanese weaves. We, uh, it's Buddhist uh, symbols of happiness and double happiness. Okay, this was uh, something that was worn um, in the second day of uh, uh, the wedding celebration, supplementary warp pattern bands alternating with um, uh, weft uh, patterns, um, um, the, uh, and this is the attire of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, the Textile Museum of Bhutan um, also employs, uh, we keep on staff, master weavers, uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, the best weavers within the country on staff, and uh, we had the honor of designing and weaving uh, their majesty's, uh, uh, majesty's attire for the second day of uh, the wedding celebrations. We sourced the gold yarn. You see the gold embellishments here from the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, uh, specifically the city, the old city of Varanasi, where we got the gold spun yarn. And uh, the, both these attires were woven at the textile museum. This is uh, another example of the boots. And uh, this was a uh, this is a display of um, our youngest pr uh, an uh, attire of our youngest princess when she was 11 years old. Okay, go to the conservation just bit now. Through, okay, I'll just run through this. Okay, now this is the raven crown when it um, came to. Uh, this was one of the older raven crowns that had come to us. This belonged to the second king of Bhutan. So uh, what was done is we, uh, we, we had to uh, do major conservation work on this. Uh, it, it, Stabilex was attached to the uh, uh, inside of uh, uh, the crown and then uh, anoxic, uh, anoxic storage, uh, it, it has been stored uh, with anoxic storage now. So don't read it, just run through it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting stressed out now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, why an oxic storage? To create constant and reduced oxygen environments, uh, to, to pr uh, protect a large group of protein-based textiles and national heritage from in, uh, uh, and heritage from insects, aerobic biological threats, smoke, dust, and hand oils. To expand preventive conservation, preventative conservation at the museum, and uh, and introduce the technology to other museums and monasteries in Bhutan. Um, this can all be done very cost effectively. Okay, don't read it, just okay. show it. Okay. Show on. I've been told to just show it. Please read it really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll switch the slides. Okay, these are the basic materials that are required to uh, uh, conduct anoxic storage. It's um, uh, escal flame barrier, uh, a barrier flame called escal, 
uh, ageless uh, uh, oxygen scavengers. Now, uh, this is a picture of uh, a, 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 an oxic bag being uh, 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 be, uh, oxygen is being uh, sucked out of it with a vacuum cleaner. And then you can see here the oxygen absorbers and uh, the ageless eyes in another picture. Then you need ageless indicator eyes, which is this. Th uh, this is a real uh, handy little uh, tablet. You, it, it detects the um, existence of uh, ox presence of oxygen in, in the in environment. You need a nitrogen gas and a with a regulator, polyethylene rods. That's the, your nitrogen tank with the polyethylene rods. Then you need a heat sealer and a vacuum cleaner fitted with a retrostat, rheostat, sorry. There you go. Okay, uh, this is a Y-hose valve system that ne it needs to be uh, uh, fabricated. Uh, the procedure, uh, proce we have, the most important thing to look uh, to pay attention to in anoxic storage is heat sealing. Uh, I mean, to, to make sure that the bags have been sealed correctly because the the store uh, the, you know the process is as good as uh, how the bags are sealed because it will fail. Okay, okay, you add the ageless. There you've got anoxic storage. Okay. Okay. Should I just read this one? Or no. Wrap up now? Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um. Thank you, Uday. And a lot of the royal textiles in the collection are actually in anoxic storage because um, it was, in the previous smaller facility, quite difficult to control the climate. And, and it was a way to ensure uh, against mildew, mold, and insect damage. So it was essentially designed for a lot of the woolens, silks, and royal collections. Okay, last but not least is Sarah, <laughs> Sarah Ryder from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and she's going to take us to Monaco in Philadelphia and try to keep on time, right? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, I, think but she's, six, I think it was 16 minutes. When yeah, I just, <laughs> um, she'll talk about Princess Grace's wedding dress. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to speak fast, but before I delve into the topic, I want to give you a very brief introduction to our museum. The Philadelphia Museum of Art maintains one of the oldest and largest collections of costume and the textiles in the United States with over 30,000 objects. It was founded in 1876 at the United States Centennial Exposition with textiles as one of the three original departments. The first collections traced the development of textile design and technique from Egypt, Greece, Persia, the Ottoman Empire, India, and India to Europe, with an emphasis on textiles from Italy and Spain. Here you see, oops, wrong way. No? What if I do this one? Okay, whatever, I'll just do this. Okay. <laughs> um, here you see a few pieces from the broad range of textiles that are currently in the collection. They include examples from Europe, Asia, America, and range from Han Dynasty 